I'd like to read to you a presentation made to the UCLA student body, made by the Peace Corps on the celebration of its fifth anniversary. It's a salutation to the University of California, Los Angeles, and its 282 alumni who have served as Peace Corps volunteers throughout the world. Following this on the scroll is a statement made by the Foreign Minister of Thailand in 1964, and I quote, It is indeed striking that this important idea, the most powerful idea in recent times, of a Peace Corps, of youth mingling, loving, working with youth, should come from this mightiest nation on earth, the United States. Many of us who did not know about the United States thought of this great nation as a wealthy nation, a powerful nation, endowed with great material strength and many powerful weapons. But how many of us know that in the United States, ideas and ideas, ideals, are also powerful? This is the secret of your greatness, of your might, which is not imposing or crushing people, but is filled with the hope of future goodwill and understanding. And in conclusion, it reads, with deep appreciation to the University of California, Los Angeles, and its alumni for their outstanding response to this opportunity of moving the people of the world nearer to peace and understanding. On behalf of the associated students of UCLA, I accept this from the Peace Corps and thank them. The speaker's program is proud to present proud to welcome Mr. Jack Vaughn, recently appointed director of the Priest Corps. Mr. Vaughn was formerly our ambassador to Panama and assistant secretary of state for Latin American affairs, and he has also served as the U.S. coordinator of the Alliance for Progress. Mr. Vaughn is speaking in connection with Peace Corps recruiting activities on campus this week. Following Mr. Vaughn's presentation, students who are seriously interested in applying to the Peace Corps may speak to him in Student Union A-Level Lounge. It now gives me great pleasure to present Mr. Vaughn, whose topic is To Peace with Love. Mr. Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I've been looking forward to being with you today, especially because California in general, and this city in particular, has been so kind to the Peace Corps. Uh, we think we know why. Uh, we think it's because you care and you're involved and you're concerned about issues, the real issues of the world, domestic and foreign. I'm very pleased to be here. When I accepted the suggestion that I speak to you today, uh, I did so with more than just a passing glance at the calendar. I knew that by this date, I might just well have a few things on my mind, uh, generated by my own understanding of the Peace Corps, heightened by reflection during the fifth anniversary of the Peace Corps, and sharpened by my first two weeks as the new boy in the block. I knew that by the time I reached you, I would have flown some 20,000 miles in a couple of weeks, uh, seeing students everywhere, meeting old Peace Corps friends, and many of them return volunteers, meeting many friends of the Peace Corps, and speaking and listening and thinking. Thoughts about the Peace Corps really ought to come easily here in California, and they do. This state leads all others 
in numbers of Peace Corps volunteers. Nearly 2,700 Californians are either in training, in service overseas, or have successfully completed Peace Corps service. 282 volunteers have entered the Peace Corps from this campus, ranking the university high among the universities and colleges throughout the United States, which provide volunteers. Moreover, UCLA is second in the nation in terms of the number of volunteers trained on campus. And since so many of those volunteers who have passed through the leading campus, Hawaii, did so en route from other training sites, I really score this as a moral victory for UCLA. For me, this noon meeting with you marks the end of the beginning. I consider myself as having been in training since Vice President Humphrey swore me in just two weeks ago, almost to the hour. Less than a week from now, I shall be overseas attending a meeting in Nairobi. In Peace Corps terms, you might say I've passed final selection and I'm on the way, although unfortunately one member of the selection board had his doubts. <laughs> I follow in the shoes of a truly remarkable leader. No more exciting man ever drove an organization into being with deeper devotion, greater selfless conviction, more generous understanding of his own fallibility, more mature compassion for anyone willing to work just half as hard as he Sergeant Shriver. And following Sarge around in the Peace Corps was bracing. And following him as the Peace Corps director is a bit shattering. And worse, judging from our looks, you might say it's like being Robin all alone with, with Batman gone from Gotham. Some words of the late President Kennedy, I think, speak best my own feelings at this hour. I've always thought that he meant them to be shared by all who would become part of the new frontier. He said, I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or with any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. I tell you now that the task from which this hour is the working start is not a task in administration of a bureaucracy, nor is it a major exper experiment in education, nor a novel phase in international relations, nor even a special kind of foreign aid. It is not nursing, nor community development, nor agricultural development, nor a host of other services to which Peace Corps volunteers turn when they arrive overseas. All of the energy and the faith, the devotion which we in the Peace Corps bring to our service serves but a single cause. That cause is peace. Yet, if you hear any note of triumph and beauty in that word, peace, then open your eyes and listen again, for you shall hear of a few things we are beginning to understand about peace. They are not very pleasant. But I think we had 
better begin to examine thoroughly what we have learned and do so right now. Lest significant opportunity for lasting peace go on escaping us far into the future as tragically as it has in the past. We have paid a bitter tuition in death, in the destruction of property, and worse, in the denigration of the human spirit. The price has been high enough to entitle us to some clear thinking and to a glimpse at remedies, if remedies exist. For if mankind has already thought its way clear of gravity, certainly we can begin to think our way clear of untimely graves. I believe it was Rochefoucauld who said that peace is war conducted by other means. Cynical? Perhaps. Cynicism is a crisis of intellect no less than despair is a crisis of the spirit. Yet who is to deny that there is crisis enough about us to excuse both cynicism and despair of peace? You who are 21 this year, what is your understanding of peace? You were born when World War II came to an end. Let's just examine some of the meaning of peace in the time your generation has come of age. In your time of peace, nation has battled nation in India, Israel, Korea, Malaysia, Panama, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Syria, Tibet, and the United Arab Republic. In your time of peace, people have slain foreign nationals during colonial uprisings in Algeria, Angola, Burma, Cameroon, the Congo, Indonesia, Kashmir, and the Malagasy Republic. In your time of peace, neighbor has slaughtered neighbor and brother fought brother in Burma, China, Colombia, the Congo, Cuba, Cyprus, Dahomey, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Gabon, Germany, Ghana, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Hungary, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Kenya, Laos, Lebanon, Malaya, Nigeria, the Philippines, Portuguese Guinea, South Africa, the Sudan, Thailand, Togo, Venezuela, Vietnam, Yemen, Zanzibar, and the United States of America. In your time of peace, the lands I know best in Latin America have witnessed nearly 2,000 riots, demonstrations, and assassinations. And men have tried no less than 80 times, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, to come to power by other than constitutional means. In your time of peace, the equivalent of all the student bodies of the University of California, some 60,000 Americans have died in battle. The toll of lives in other lands numbers in the millions. In your time of peace. War, said Clemenceau, is too serious a matter to be left entirely in the hands of the generals. Surely then, peace has proven too dangerous a matter to be left entirely in the hands of the diplomats. Let's take a sterner look at what has been palmed off as peace in your time. We seem to be able to spot phony war fast enough. What about phony peace? I think we might start by admitting that peace can indeed be war conducted by other means. That peace can be a weapon. It is a weapon when it is just a state of mind, which is an alternative to war. A kind of no man's years between the wars. A cessation of violence. 
a significant pause. In such case, peace is a method, part of an arsenal, an instrument of war. We tend to, quote, safeguard such peace. Yet I submit that to safeguard peace is to admit its peril. Peace needs no safeguard when it needs no spokesman. Real peace needs little vigil. Moreover, I suggest that peace has no lasting value, little promise, and hardly any utility if it attracts any attention at all. I believe that real peace is the freedom to be totally unconcerned about war. Peace should encourage genuine freedom of action, freedom to be restless without fear, freedom to be adventurous, to take risks, to grow, to stir, to match wits with nature and with our fellow man, freedom, if you will, to become civilized. What tragedy, then, when the politics of peace bring violence itself? For when the dead are buried, the living have gained nothing. What irony, moreover, when even without violence, peace bears bitter fruit, when a mass of people find they have no alternatives to better their lives, nor any hope of security from their own government, while they learn enough of self-improvement to create new alternatives when a small entrenched class clings to every advantage. What larceny, finally, when people resign the struggle to follow the man with the system neatly buttoned up and ready to go with a new order, even though that order steals freedom in freedom's name. For people who cannot share abundance, peace has no value and no utility. Not for the peasant and the slum dweller locked out of wealth, society, and mobility in Latin America. Not for the men and women freshly come to new freedom, all too easily turn to anarchy for want of trained leadership in Africa not for the peasant and the worker striving to produce more than just bare subsistence in the Far East. For such people, there is no note of triumph or beauty in that word, peace. Make no mistake, those people are independent, yet they guard their nation's freedom with deeper conviction than they guard their own personal freedom. They have learned all about sovereignty and nationalism and chauvinism. They have learned all the slogans of national power, of freedom, sovereignty, and independence. But they have learned nearly nothing of personal liberty and hence of freedom peace has concerned them as nations, it has given them nothing as human beings. Then what has been the record of peace in these times? It has been an illusion. Peace has served war by breeding war afresh. Peace has served diplomacy by affording pause to maneuver. But peace has not served man. Seven million Indians have lived in the mountains and jungles of Peru, hardly moving out of the 18th century, all in times of peace. Millions of human beings of so-called lower caste have starved to death or have died of dread disease in India and Pakistan in times of peace. 900 million adult men and women alive today will pass through this life never having written or read a word of their own 
or any other tongue in times of peace. And how many countless millions will not so much as lift a finger to change their lot because they have no comprehension of even the gentlest revolution in times of peace. I have said that in the Peace Corps we serve a single cause, the cause of peace. Yet now surely you must see that there is a modern dilemma inherent in our service. For we have been brought up, you and I, taught to believe that peace is virtuous in itself and that because it is virtuous, it deserves guardians. I suggest that peace in and of itself is anything but virtuous. And the most profound demand of this day and age is the service of men and women who will lend virtue to peace itself. Truly made virtuous, it will need less guardians. Yet, when the first shots ring out, how quickly we spend ink and wind and shoe leather bemoaning the injustice done to peace, as in the Dominican Republic. That tragic caricature of a society choked off from freedom, whose first dictator was Christopher Columbus, and whose last dictator called all the shots, including those which ended 30,000 lives of his fellow citizens in his ugly reign of terror. When Trujillo died, power passed so swiftly that the seething hate of 30 years, or was it 430 years, never had a chance to explode upon the surface until a, a later time which found me on the spot. I tell you here and now that I am proud to have had a hand in stopping the bloody massacre among the Dominican people. For I have known and I have served those people far longer than the instant experts have known either the Dominican Republic or my politics. I stood against the bloodletting then, and I would do so again today. But I am prouder still to have sent the first Peace Corps volunteers to the Dominican people. For they, and they alone, went between the lines and among the wounded on both sides, trusted, believed in, respected, and loved by those who came near them during battle, just as they were trusted and respected by those whom they came near before the battle ever started. Peace Corps volunteers served the Dominican people before President Bosch came to office. When President Bosch was in office, they served when he was deposed. They served during military rule and civilian juntas. They are still serving on the job, and they will probably stay on the job whatever the outcome of the free elections to be held in June. For as with the Peace Corps volunteers everywhere, their concern has precious little to do with politics and with power. They are concerned with serving people, not as guardians of peace, but by imparting utility and virtue to peace itself. And the peace they serve without illusion is the peace of which President Kennedy spoke when he said, not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, and the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children, not mere, merely peace for Americans, 
but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. You ask our policy then in the Peace Corps. I will say it is to wage peace by dedicating ourselves to the task of lending virtue to peace for years to come. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, survival. Nobody could dare predict a winner today in an arms race. Nobody could care to be a winner in World War III. You ask, what is our enemy? I would answer, answer illusion. The mighty issues which raise the placards, print the pamphlets, and bring men to the barricades are illusions themselves. For we have learned in Ghana, in the Dominican Republic, and in a dozen Vietnams that progress for mankind can never really be measured in causes and in coups, but in precious inches of human understanding and enlightenment. Scantly noticed, grudgingly surrendered from indifference and from despair, toiled after, lost, missed, and sought after again. These are the unseen battles and the silent victories of peace. They are won by quiet heroes whose politics is people, whose nationality is mankind. These are the men and women who serve the cause of peace by grappling at the very level where results count, where people live and where people must survive. These are the Peace Corps volunteers. No better description of their service can be found than in words President Johnson spoke last month at Freedom House. Indeed, I commend them to the attention of every Peace Corps volunteer now in service, to men and women thinking of Peace Corps service, and to every person and organization associated with us now and in the years ahead. The President said, you have known too that men who believe they can change their destinies will change them. Armed with that belief, they will be willing, they will be eager to make the sacrifices that freedom demands. They will be anxious to shoulder the responsibilities that are inseparably bound to freedom. They will be able to look beyond the four essential freedoms to the freedom to learn, to master new skills, to acquaint themselves with the lore of man and nature, to the freedom to grow, to become the best that is within them to become, to cast off the yoke of discrimination and disease, to the freedom to hope and to build on that hope lives of integrity and of well-being. Such has been the essence and object of Peace Corps service during the last five years. I pledge here and now that it will continue to be so for the next five years, and I am convinced that it will continue to be so for many, many years to come. The remarkable people who are the Peace Corps volunteers are our best assurance that such will be the case. Indeed, our faith in them has shifted more and more leadership into their hands. There are more than 320 return volunteers on the Peace Corps staff right now. It is no secret that I want my successor to be among them. Right from the outset, it was they who led us. We thought we would be building some kind of junior foreign service. They taught us that their business was human service. We thought we had to defer our judgment to all sorts of experts in deciding who should serve overseas. They taught us to pay less attention to the heartbeat 
and more to the offbeat. We thought we had to teach them of politics and history. They taught us that they would be writing their own history. Thank you. And although politics was a passing interest from the point of view of national development, they were far more concerned with human development. We thought we had to train them to a fare thee well in their professional skills. They taught us, as one volunteer said recently, that their skill was their attitude. 18,000 men and women have served in the Peace Corps. 12,000 are overseas right now. They have served in 46 different lands, and with the addition of Chad and Bechuana land and Korea announced this week, the number will soon be 49. They have brought over 325 different skills and arts to the peoples of those lands, and they have served those people in 60 different languages. Yet, however diverse their station or their service, Peace Corps volunteers have discovered that their worst enemies were the same everywhere. Not ignorance, but indifference. Not poverty, but apathy. Not hunger, but despair. I pride myself in having visited more Peace Corps volunteers at their jobs overseas than any other man alive. I believe I have seen almost 3,500 volunteers on location. I have shared their straw mats and their dysentery in almost 500 villages and towns throughout Latin America. I think I am qualified to offer some observations. Thank you. Volunteers have learned that above all their other arts, they have had to practice and master the art of the possible. For as Aristotle said, they can because they think they can. Moreover, volunteers have learned that they are becoming involved in useful social reform. For successful volunteers cannot help but teach that change is possible, and what is more, that change is not a fearsome unknown, but a responsibility to be shared and encouraged by governments of lands in which they serve. Thus, volunteers are surely spreading the word, whether by design or accident or example, that peace invites adventure, mobility, and self-expression. In our time, such is the highest possible service to true social revolution. In any time, it is the highest possible service to the cause of lasting peace. But responsibility for such service cannot be lightly given, nor should it be summarily withdrawn. Peace Corps volunteers deal in terms of critical human values. They must enjoy the broadest possible leeway in judgment and in personal communication. We impose upon them neither political nor policy guidelines. A volunteer is on his own, and he won't have it any other way. He is not an instrument of American foreign policy. Rather, he is a living token of the human aspirations and good wishes of the American people. What we are about in the Peace Corps is not to assure the future, our way. It is to assure a future, any way at all. Thus, we have tried to choose our volunteers with utmost care. As a result, the Peace Corps is America's most selective service. And I pledge to you and your colleagues and contemporaries that it will continue to be so. 
we shall persist in seeking people who are not afraid of what they are, yet who are curious about what they will become. And we shall not fear to invite protesters. For what is the Peace Corps idea if not a form of serviceable protest in behalf of human beings for whom protest has yet to be of any service at all? I went, want to add, however, that I really am not very excited about what I believe to be the momentary issue of the draft. If we begin to see Peace Corps service as nothing but a substitute for military service, we may well lose sight of the idea that in time the Peace Corps should become a substitute for all military service. Thus, for the moment, we shall have to risk the inroads which the draft may cause, acknowledging the paradox that could we but have at any single time the number of young men who have to serve in battle, we would surely be a long way home toward an end to all battles. For that very reason, it will be my purpose in the coming years to multiply by many times the number of volunteers in service overseas. We should never fear to see the Peace Corps grow. Back in Washington, we have, have at times sought to attach the label of numbers game to the idea of growth and proliferation in the Peace Corps. I think that such a term is a red herring and a vanity. It is not for us to say, in the long run, how great the number, for it should be, not be for us to judge how great the need. The people we serve, I think, will make that decision for us. Perhaps it might indeed be a numbers game, were we to hypo the figures at home. But it is no game, in fact, it is a deadly serious matter when numbers must grow to meet desperate need abroad. As far as I'm concerned, we must be willing to do anything in our power, move anything in our way, rise to any challenge, demand any assistance to get the job done. Life ought to be more than a fatal ailment. For two-thirds of the people of this planet, it is barely more than that. And so long as such is the case, this earth is not at peace. You say, peace at any price. I say, peace has no price in terms that ought to have real meaning for all of us, the cost of peace is no more than the cost of love itself. And here and now, I suppose, is as good a time as any to break down some embarrassments and inhibitions and give this game a name. For of what have we been speaking? Toward what have we been groping, if not toward love? I shall not quarrel if it is your style to mask that word with others like understanding, or giving, or generosity, or even that halfway mystery, enlightened self-interest. But if our task is serving the cause of lasting peace, then we are trying to deliver a coded message without a key, unless we admit that the key is love, and the message is man's belief that he can make himself and every other man higher than animals. In Kenya, where I am going next week, anthropologists are learning that man may not be quite so nobly born as he once thought, that man's ancestor came out of the trees with a bludgeon in his hand, 
a killer not only for survival, but for territory as well. I think they are trying to tell us that we are not programmed in innocence. If that is so, I think we ought to welcome the news. It might offer some explanation of where we have been, but no excuse. Better still, it is the kind of understandable warning with which this generation has come to grips, for better or for worse, far more readily than when they are written in the mysteries of philosophy or the parables of religion. If we are not programmed in innocence, that is a fact to be reckoned with. But man has love. That is another fact to be reckoned with. So let us learn in full of our guilt. In terms of the dialectic, we shall at least know the fullest extent of the pressure which consciously or unconsciously dissuades us from lasting peace. In terms even I can understand, we are fighters, but we are lovers just the same. And knowing we are fighters makes our love the stronger, for it is our love which we must nourish and enrich if peace is to withstand the onslaught of nature. This is a challenge worth taking, and I commend it to you as earnestly as I dedicate, it, dedicate myself to it today. Come join us and we shall finish the words Robert Frost struggled so hard and unsuccessfully to repeat that bright shining day five years ago. It makes the prophet in us all presage the glory of a next Augustan age, of a power leading from its strength and pride of young ambition eager to be tried, firm in our free beliefs without dismay, in any game the nations want to play, a golden age of poetry and power of which this noonday's the beginning hour. Thank you very much. Uh, it's up to you if we have five minutes. Thank you. If you have any questions you'd like to address to Mr. Vaughn, he has about five or six minutes or so, and he'd be glad to answer them, I'm sure. Anybody? Well, that, yes? The question was if a communist can, can communists be admitted to the Peace Corps? The question was, I believe, can communists be admitted to the Peace Corps, or are they forbidden? Uh, the answer is they cannot be admitted to the Peace Corps. That gentleman over there. Du Bois Club's now. Uh, I didn't mean to, uh, in the first response, to, to sound cynical, uh, and I should give a more fulsome response to such questions. The, the fact is this. The Peace Corps does not seek out any special group or club or organization for its volunteers. Uh, what we seek is the very best of our society in terms of dedication to service, in terms of character, and concern for one's fellow man. 
and that's all. Uh, we don't uh, really care about clubs. Uh, I was asked this morning, how many Negroes are Peace Corps volunteers? And I had to say, I don't have the faintest idea. And if you ask the director of training uh, in the Peace Corps or the head of selection, how many Mexican-Americans are in the Peace Corps? The answer would be, I don't know, because we don't care the color of any part of you or anything about you other than your character and your preparedness, your willingness, competence to serve your fellow man. And uh, there are certain categories of people who advocate the overthrow of the United States by violence, who uh, probably couldn't get through the normal civil service check we do on all trainees, but uh, I wouldn't care to, to comment on what these groups are. There are such groups, uh, but uh, we don't uh, have any analogy or don't make any comparison between organizations and clubs and Peace Corps service. That's something outside Peace Corps volunteers who in a very important way are all the same and all in the same club. Uh, any more questions? This is uh, the question that has uh, recurred constantly, and I think it is a most valid question. My answer is, uh, incidentally, I was Frank Mankiewicz's predecessor in uh, a lively area, and uh, I think that he and I would answer it the same way. I may be wrong, but we don't uh, try to gag any trainee. We don't brainwash them. We just say, you are expected to be a mature, enlightened U.S. citizen. And you are expected to be a lady or a gentleman, as far as your own criteria of what that means. Uh, you are not an agent of propaganda. Uh, to give you an example of what the kind of trouble that a volunteer can get into and our response, there was a volunteer who recently, in Africa, published a tract, a propaganda sheet, uh, and that he distributed widely that had to do with U.S. foreign policy, and he was brought back to the United States. That, in our opinion, and my opinion today, is one step too far. I mean, I don't think that when you go abroad to serve another nation or the people of that nation, that you should get involved in printing uh, fly leafs and, and newspapers for general domestic consumption over there that gives your view of how right or how wrong our foreign policy is or the foreign policy of that government. I think that's a little, uh, I mean, I think that's clearly a little out of bounds. Uh, but. Uh, we prefer that volunteers not get up on the soapbox overseas. Uh, this is misunderstood. Talking with their friends, other university students or faculty, and expressing their views, whether they agree with U.S. foreign policy or not, that's fine. But we don't expect them to get up on the podium or to write letters to the editor of foreign press and saying uh, down with something in the United States or up with. Uh, so it's, it's more of an informal, uh, that isn't quite what I want to say. Uh, it's, uh, it's a personal matter that if handled on a personal basis that doesn't go to the mass media, we don't have a problem. 
Yes, sir. Is the Peace Corps contemplating sending volunteers to the impoverished areas of Micronesia? This is, a, uh, this is uh, the trust territories area that has intrigued me greatly, and I, th I think that we could do better than others are doing it. I think we could do better on the Indian reservations than others have done it. And uh, this has been considered. Uh, we'll probably know by midsummer if the Peace Corps is get going to get involved in these trust territories in Micronesia. My personal hope is that we will, and the more involved, the better. Yes, sir. Will the Peace Corps branch out into any new areas under your direction? Uh, it will. The first of these are the Reverse Peace Corps, which we hope to start this fall, or the Exchange Peace Corps, which will involve volunteers coming from the more developed nations to teach or work in the United States or do research, and a commensurate number going to that country. Japan would send us 200 volunteers, teachers and others, and we would send 200 volunteers to Japan, or Yugoslavia, or West Germany, or Poland. I don't think we should rule out any nation uh, in this regard. The more we know about each other, the greater the exchange and flow. Obviously, we all agree, the better the chances of real understanding and real peace. Then there is a school-to-school -school program that is going to be started, I think, also this fall. There, as I suggested in my speech, is going to be an expansion in the number of countries that receive Peace Corps volunteers. I would hope to see 15 or 16 new countries in the coming year and a half. All of the other changes will be minor and uh, bureaucratic and tactical. I'm sorry, I think that's all I have time for, but you're very kind to come here. I appreciate it.